American Experience is television's most watched and longest running history series and the recipient of every major primetime, excuse me, every major industry award including Peabody Award, Primetime Emmys, Writers Guild and more. Prior to WGBH, Mark worked as an independent documentary filmmaker and executive producer for several public television stations. So, Mark, welcome. Next we have John Maggio, producer and director of the film Billy the Kid. writer, director, and producer of documentary films. His work includes several films for Frontline, American Experience, and his films have been honored with National Emmy Awards, the Writers Guild Award, and more. His work is also premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. And just as an aside, about an hour ago, we were grabbing a bite to eat across the street. And as um, these guys do, always do, you know, check in the Blackberry, check in the emails, and just little note came through, John Maggio was just uh, nominated for a Writer's Guild Award. Just found out this other hour ago. And American Experience was nominated for five Writer's Guild Awards. We just found out. Also joining us on the panel tonight is New York Times best-selling author, Hampton Sides. Mexico-based historian and author whose books include Ghost Soldiers, Blood and Thunder, and Hellbound on His Trail. He's <laughs> written for Outside Magazine, National Geographic, the New, York po the New Yorker, and the Washington Post. And last but not least, we have our musician from earlier and historian Mark Lee Gardner. books and articles on the American West on subjects ranging from George Custer to Geronimo. He's the author of To Hell, to Hell on a Fast Horse, Billy the Kid, Pat Garrett, and the Epic Chase to Justice in the Old West. That could be a PBS show, you know, because it's really a long title. And a <laughs> <laughs> so, and the discussion will be moderated tonight, as I mentioned, by uh, host of New Mexico in Focus, Gene Grant. <laughs> I'm very proud to say. Um, and Gene has been a veteran journalist, columnist, and he's worked at the Albuquerque Tribune, the Albuquerque Journal, and the Weekly Alibi. He joined k in 2005 as a regular panelist on The Line and is now the sole host of k hour hour-long public affairs show, New Mexico in Focus. So, welcome, Gene. I'm going to turn it over to Gene and now to moderate our discussion. Oh, Thank you, Polly. So sweet. She's a great boss. That's awesome. Thank you all for coming out on a cold night. Um, we had a very interesting time with this discussion last night in Albuquerque, and no doubt tonight will be the same. I did have a chance to watch this a couple of nights ago, and you know, for whatever it's worth, let me just say from a personal opinion, I think New Mexico is going to be very proud of this production. This is a very, very, very interesting story. I personally learned a lot. I think Joe just did a terrific story arc here. And there's just so much to this person, this character, this mystery of Billy the Kid that we're it's, it's really, really good stuff. So I thank you all very much for coming out to participate. Let me start with you, Mark. I, have a, I do have a question. No, I'll knock that later. Um, regarding the American experience, first of all, congratulations. Thanks okay. for, uh, for the WGA yeah. noms. That's pretty cool. Um, American experience, let's just tackle that first. I think we can all get some agreement in the room here that American Experience kicks a big butt. It's a great show. Yeah, that's a, that should be a slogan. That's right. That's right. We kick some major butts. That's right. And you've profiled some amazing people in our culture, some really iconic figures. How does Billy fit into that and that decision process of to actually commit resources to something that, you know, I'm sure in your shop think, well, is this a regional story? Is this a national story? Is it international? What was the decision process there? Well, it, you know, uh, Gene, it's, um, it's interesting because, you know, 
not a day goes by practically where someone doesn't come up to me and say, you know, uh, how about so and so? That's not the best experience. I don't know what is. And um, you know, it's true. There's, you know, there's thousands and tens of thousands of individuals who've mattered in American history, and hundreds and maybe thousands of events. And so the choice of you know what warrants uh, the subject is really comes down to a story. And uh, about five or six years ago, we made a film on Jesse James um, because there had been a new book, frankly, about Jesse James that had been upended completely the myth and the story that we'd all grown up with about who Jesse James was. So we followed, that did extremely well for us, so we followed that with some other programs about Western icons, Andy Oakley, and Geronimo, and Wider last year. And, I was, and they all did well. And because, you know, you could just tap into that romanticism of the West. And actually, you know, I think it's really so American. It's, um, you know, living in Boston, being on the East Coast, you know, tend to think of America as, as being huddled along that East Coast, but, you know, 120, 30 years ago, Americans in New York and along that, that corridor were just obsessed with what was going on out here, because this is where the country was, this is where it felt like it was happening, and the news was traveling back by telegraph, and um, it became really entwined with what it meant to be an American what was going on in the West. And so I was looking for a story, and I knew I'd known about Billy the Kid for a long time, but didn't know that much. And two things struck me that made me think that we needed to do this. Um, one was I came across Michael Andachi's um, book about Billy the Kid. And he's, a, he's, a, he's a novelist who grew up in Sri Lanka, literally on the other side of the world. And what's in his book but a little photo of him as an eight-year-old with holsters and pistols and a little vest and, mm -hmm. Trying to be Billy the Kid. <laughs> and the other was uh, an article in The New Yorker uh, by Fintan O'Toole, who makes a brief appearance as a writer for the Dublin Times, who said, you know, the Irish English conflict is one of the oldest in the world. And believe it or not, it actually had an act that was played out in the plains of New Mexico. And that was the Lincoln County War. And at the center of that was Billy the Kid. And I thought, you know what, this is more than a New Mexican story, it's more than a Western story, it's more than an American story. That's, that was the easy decision at that point. Yeah. And then, Joe, for yourself, approaching the story, where do you start? I mean, there's so many things written, like you mentioned, and obviously you mentioned that the amount of movies and, and television shows and things. How do you start to peel back the layers on this and find your story that yeah, you want to tell? First one is Derek Jean, but it's John. No, oh, that's that's right. Right. no, no, it's only because Joe DiMaggio is another. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm often confused. <laughs> not, not at the Santa Fe, New Mexico, unfortunately. Joe and John? Yeah, Joe and John. <laughs> I love your wife, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I really I still think about it. I knew the name Billy the Kid, but I didn't really know much about who he was. Uh, I, I didn't grow up watching Young Guns or Young Guns 2, which was unfortunately the last two sort of films that we think about when we think about Billy the Kid. And I, you know, so when Mark told me, he also told me, uh, the other thing is there's one photograph, which is a filmmaker, you can imagine it's an incredible challenge. To <laughs> sort of but what I always try to do with, with any character that I take on in a historical film is, is to try to find the humanity um, Billy, as I learned, is cloaked in myth. Um, and the first thing I tried to do was I, I sought out the people who have been writing about him most recently to try to figure out the themes that would emerge collectively from these, from these historians and these thinkers and people that thought about him. And then the other thing that I do that is a kind of a hallmark of my work when I do historical pieces is that I talk to storytellers and authors and fiction writers who thought about <coughs> Billy because they come at it from a wholly different angle than a historian or an anthropologist. They think about the interior life of a character the way that a historian may not. Um, and it helps bring the character to life. So that was my goal, was to try to humanize Billy in some way. Um, it's tough because it's such a romantic story. I mean, he is such a rebel character. Um, so I try to ride this line of finding the and separating myth from fact, and but it's hard. That's all. Just great. It's such a rich story. Was there was there a certain point in 
any part of the process, filming, researching, editing, where you felt like you started to know this guy? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you can't help but relate to him. I mean, he's the character we all love an underdog in this country. I mean, we're founded, we're an immigrant country, and we're founded, uh, you know, we're all underdogs. And um, Billy's the kind of ultimate underdog. And, and I, I think what drew me to him was that he was this sort of orphan guy. And I was thinking of my own self at 12 years old, 13 years old, out. I grew up in Buffalo, a very different place, in the, in the mid-1970s. Um, and, and so imagine being 12 or 13 years old out here, you know, and, and trying to make your way. And, 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 uh, and so I was drawn to that aspect of him, too. And, you know, I think that there was a, he got swept up into events early in his life. And it's not so later in his life that he, he kind of takes control and, and that rebel side of his manifest. Mm, interesting, interesting. Uh, here to the next one. And uh, you're terrific in the film. We haven't even seen yourself yet. It's that clip, I guess. You did great. Okay. You're, you're terrific. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> I appreciate um, John mentioning his interior life. And I have to imagine this is something you've given some thought to as well. Um, I, I, I can tell you, from, for me, when I got finished watching the piece, I, it was actually a sense of, of sadness in a way because it seemed like this guy lived this very lonely life. He was either on the run or... You know, the epic walk, you know, those kind of things. A lot of time to really grind his life. Where am I? What am I doing? What, what am I caught up in here? What's your sense of him and, and his survival uh, sort of vibe of going through all this stuff back then? Did you ever, ever give that some thought to you about that interior stuff? As well? well, I kind of have to back up and explain that uh, I'm kind of the contrarian of the panel. I, I'm uh, the person who, uh, for the longest time, I, and I've had this sort of evolution in my thinking about Billy the Kid, but for the longest time when I moved here, 17, 18 years ago, I just thought, what is the deal with this Billy the Kid? I mean, the story would not shut up. Um, as far as I can tell, in my initial reading of the thing, he was kind of a thug who got, you know, mixed up with the wrong people. I mean, they were fighting over beef contracts. And uh, this is the most famous guy in my state that I've decided to, to live in. Well, yeah, you know, there's a lot of other interesting Billy the Kid. Uh, there's a, besides Billy the Kid, there's a lot of other interesting people from New Mexico. I mean, Robert Goddard, you know, the rocket scientist, or Aldo Leopold, or, or Robert Oppenheimer, or Kit Carson, who I later in, uh, ended up writing a book about. You know, there's a lot of interesting people. Why is this guy, along with, of course, Roswell, um, the story <laughs> um, of, that is sort of synonymous with New Mexico? I could not figure it out. And, and, and uh, Mark, you mentioned that I, I'm from Memphis originally, and I, I kind of had the same thing with Elvis. When he died, I was a young teenager, and uh, I didn't understand why all these millions of people coming to Memphis and laying their leaves at Graceland, and this phenomenon was building and building and building and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah, okay, he could dance, he could sing, you know, but why, why Elvis? Why now? So, so I kind of put this on par with that. It's like, Billy the Kid is one of these stories, though, that, I mean, you're just about unpatriotic, you're just about subversive, you don't ultimately buy into it. You know, if you're going to live here in the next year. Um, and so I, somewhere along the line, stuff stops fighting. And it was probably last year when I wrote an op-ed uh, editorial uh, in the New York Times um, saying that Governor Richardson was crazy for trying to pardon Billy the Kid. Uh, I said, this is a tired old shoot him up, and what's the deal with this thing? Make this story go away. And I can't tell you how many letters I got, how many phone calls I got. Um, one from me. <laughs> you, know, you just don't get it. You know, what's wrong with you? You're, you're not a New Mexican. So it's sort of like, you better like Green Chili, and you better like Billy the Kid. If you want to um, what was he really like, though, in, in his interior life? Um, I, the closest I've come to understanding that kind of fugitive existence was the book I wrote about um, James Earl Ray and, and uh, his assassination of Martin Luther King. And, you know, that kind of fugitive existence is, uh, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's incredibly lonely, it's incredibly, um, um, very much, as you say, an interior existence. Um, how much self-realization Billy the Kid had, I don't really know. That's a good question. <coughs> um, you know, he seems to be a very outward person, really. Someone who really was affable, someone who really loved people. He really loved Hispanic culture here. Uh, he wanted to intersect with people, but he had, always had to move to somewhere else. And I think 
that's kind of the contradiction in his life, is being a fugitive, but really wanting to stay, really wanting to stay put somewhere and make a life for himself. Yeah. It's interesting, because it is impossible to figure out his you know, thought process or anything, but well, two books, we don't have diaries, we don't have anything. Have you had a chance to read the letters that were pointed out in the, in the film that are, that are here? In this, in this I read excerpts of them about <laughs> the letters he wrote to Governor uh, yeah. uh, Wallace. Um, I, read, I read them online. I haven't read the actual letter, but is that really his handwriting, by the way? I mean, it's so yeah. elegant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. He, he, he knew how to read and write. No, I mean, the quality of letters. Palmer penmanship, you know, it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you must know the answer. Oh, yeah, well, there's letters, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's his right handwriting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, you can really get in, I mean, there's all kinds of controversies when you get under the surface of Billy the Kid. And, and, you know, some people notice differences in the handwriting style. And, well, Billy had his handcuffs on when he had to write that letter. Or somebody wrote that for Billy because, you know, and it's all possible. It, Billy was ambidextrous. Maybe he wrote one with his right hand. And one with his I mean, you know. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You know. But, you know, I, I think half the reason you have trouble with Elvis and Billy is because you're a rebel, too. Is there a velvet of Billy and Elvis? <laughs> 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 yeah. well, in the know. frontier? What that is, though, is um, <laughs> seriously, in Russia. I think we've got two million for that. Maybe you guys are probably. <laughs> You have it. So, yeah. Down in Roswell, like, every year they have this uh, convention of the UFO thing, and uh, they have a costume contest. And the best categories, the two biggest categories, are uh, Alien Elvis and Alien Billy the Kid. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. It's amazing. Mark, thank you for your music, by the way. Oh, sure. That was really terrific. It was really sweet to hear you as well. And I, I, I thought you did that, Dylan. I got a question. This is almost impossible to answer, just like the question for Hampton, but any two bit hoodlum I've ever known in my life has, they all have this one trait. They can assimilate anywhere almost instantly, right? They can almost like figure out the way of the land. Who's got the power? Who doesn't? Who, you know, I, I just have this imagining in my own head that this is part of his emotional makeup. He knows how to assimilate into situations. Very quickly and very elegantly, as a matter of fact, and just be in instantly. It's interesting. Yeah, I, you know, one, and I say this in the film. Uh, one of the things that struck me is that he was really a very, very intelligent human being. I mean, uh, he was like you say, he was very quick to adapt, very, very smart. Um, and one of his really uh, great um, uh, traits uh, for him to survive was that he had this appearance and he had this persona. Where he was, you know, goofy and you know, silly and and uh, oh, that guy can't hurt me, you know, and he's just he's just a kid or whatever, and and, uh, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this later. But he had his famous escape in, in Lincoln, you know, and Bob Ollinger discounts him completely, and that leads to his death. And it seemed like it happened so many times. People underestimated him, and they died. Uh, and that, you know, and to me, that's a sign of his intelligence. How he's able to trick, fool people. And uh, escaped many, many times so because they underestimated his abilities. Sure. It seems like also his was a life of reacting to things that came his way. Not so, not so much guys that he put things into motion. He didn't have a really a strong moral imperative or a, or a strong goal. But he was reacting to a lot of things around him. He was caught up in something that was beyond his control. And it, you know, again, you know, how you, one survives out here during territorial times must have been just a huge challenge. But the lay of the land, let's, let's hone in on, on Lincoln County and you just get the, the, the landscape kind of set there. Talk a bit, bit about what was going on, what, what he got found himself caught in, the power structure, the politics, the law, all that kind of thing. And we'll get into the details. Of well, sure. Lincoln County at that time took up all of southeastern New Mexico. I mean, it was the largest county in the United States at that time. Um, there was a big military fort there uh, near Lincoln, uh, Fort Stanton. Um, it's very lucrative if you have a business to supply beef, supply produce uh, to Fort Stan. And, and a firm uh, who had the sellers uh, appointment there and had a big store in Lincoln for years and years was what was called the house. And John covers this very well uh, in the film. And uh, Lawrence Murphy and Jimmy Dolan and, and the whole cast of Irishmen, who were actually all military veterans as well. Um, and uh, they controlled that business there. And all of a sudden you have someone move in 
who wants to do the same thing that they're that they want to create a monopoly. Well, that's John Henry Tunstall, this young Englishman, who, by the way, is only about four years older than Billy the Kid. In all the movies, you see this elderly father-like figure. You know, that wasn't John Tunstall. He, you know, but but they developed a friendship. I mean, John Tunstall, uh, instead of uh, prosecuting Billy, he gives Billy a job, uh, and uh, he also treated Billy really kind of like an equal. He didn't look down at him and uh, kind of gave Billy a chance. Uh, and that created this bond. Uh, and so you had these two firms competing for the business in Lincoln County, and it's, it's a matter of where a few turns to uh, bloodshed. And uh, John Henry Tunstall's murder, and of course Billy's, you know, uh, looks up to John Henry Tunstall as his friend. And, and uh, this is the other thing that I, I, I find fascinating with these outlaw figures, and it doesn't matter if it's Jesse James or Billy the Kid, or some modern day gang, but a really strong component of their makeup is this concept of revenge. You know, these guys are going to get who got you, who got them. And when John Henry Tunstall is killed, Billy says, I'm going to get some of them before I die. And, and he does. And you find it was Jesse James in the Civil War, the Pontos Guerrillas. It was all about revenge, usually. And with gang, it's like, you know, they did this, we're going to get them. And, and revenge is such a big part of Billy's personality. And I think that explains you know, sort of the, the violent deeds that he committed. And there was a lot of violence. I mean, there was a lot of dead bodies in Lincoln County at that time. The, the body count was crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, you know, Billy is responsible by his own hand for killing four men. Mm -hmm. But with the regulators, uh, he was involved in maybe as many as eight or nine uh, killings. Interesting. Um, Mark, that the nexus of Irish culture and English culture in Lincoln County this thing is so fascinating. As Mark just said, you know, you, you've got Billy working for this Englishman that you would think in that time period would be a natural enemy, right? And then he's going against two Irish guys, the two strong strong arms in Lincoln County, and you'd think they would be natural allies, but it just didn't work out that way, did it? It's very interesting. And, and again, we can't know his interior thoughts on this. I'm not sure if there's much conflict beyond you know, keeping his butt alive. Spark was said. But but touching on that a little bit, what's going on in Lincoln County with that nexus of Irish and, and English? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's pretty uh, safe to say this never would have played out this way in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> that said, um, no, I think I think the story shows. Um, I think Billy's story shows that. You know, underneath these um, sort of mythical individuals that we like to celebrate, and individualism is such an American trait that we like to celebrate. You know, they think these, these people like Jesse James and Billy the Kid pop up and they don't have any context, they don't come out of any story. Billy comes out of a really strong soil. First of all, it comes out of this huge collision of these three worlds here in New Mexico, the Hispanic world, the Indian world, and the Anglo world. Um, that really shapes him. He comes out of this historic time in the 1870s and 80s, where there's this massive expansion of the railroads, you know, mining interests in the West, and the East Coast money's flowing in here in a big way. Some of it flows through the house and they cream off, and somebody else wants to take their little skim off of that, at least with some trouble. Yep. Um, but I think on a, a level that I think that we're really attracted to in the series that I work for, um, there's a universal story here, and I think it actually trumps the, these things, and that is, he, I think he really is looking for some connection, some family some belonging. And so the fact that Tom Still is an Englishman, I think, is secondary to the fact that he's someone, you know, Billy steals his horses. Um, Tom Still's horses. And he's, in, he's arrested, he's in jail. Tom Still comes down to see him and instead of sort of pressing charges, he hires him. And there's something about Billy that's charismatic. There's something that draws people. And he sees some potential in him. Maybe, maybe all he sees in him is that he's a potential defender, regulator. You know, he's a tough cookie. But there might be something else. And Billy sees something in him, and maybe he sees some connection, a little brother, mm -hmm. some belonging, some sense of family. You know what I mean? He's pretty rootless, pretty much on his own. So I think those are the, the kind of things in these stories that make this a story that can travel around the world, because it's we're all seeking that. We're all looking for that belonging, and no matter where we are. And I think that's why he's such a romantic figure, and no matter what culture you're from, you can find some affinity or some identity with, with this rebel who's alone, who's young, who's vulnerable, who's trying to make it in this world. Mm -hmm. That's it. I appreciate that. It's interesting. And again, just to touch on it again, the absolute control that these guys had in Lincoln County was, I did mention in the film that there wasn't a dime that moved in that county they didn't get a piece of, but we were just alluding to. So their power was just, you know, beyond the beyond. It was unquestioned. 
So for, for, for you, Johnny, you know, it, it's interesting how to, uh, by the way, I still love your wife, man. She is so <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, <laughs> the, you know, this idea of, of longing to belong somewhere. I loved in the film that you touched on how deep were the connections went with Hispanic culture at that time. And the idea that he could be taken in, even when he was on the run. It wasn't as if, oh, no, you're an outlaw, don't, don't come in here. You know, there was something about that that seemed, I, I have to imagine, that suited him. He had no one else in his corner, when you think about it. Yeah, no, no I, I think that's really true. I think I, I, I come to it with a little bit of, of my own um, sort of a baggage about this. My, my wife is a, is a public defender in the Bronx, and, uh, and it's a tough place. And, 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 and you know, I, I, like a lot of people who talk to public defenders, they say, well, how could you defend that person? You know? And my wife always tells me that, you know, when you're sitting next to somebody who's been accused of a horrible crime, there's a humanity there, no matter what. It's an inescapable. And, and I think that I carry that with me to, to storytelling, and, and, and I think that that's what I saw in Billy. I mean, I think he's a kid who was looking, as we say in the film, kind of always looking for a home. And, and, and every single adult that he encounters is, is corrupt and, and turns, his, turns their back on him. And, and so you can't help but, but be attracted to that kind, of, that, that kind of character. And of course, it's not until Lou Wallace turns his back on him that, that, that he he finally kind of decided, well, then I'm not going to look for it. I'm going to just dumb my nose at him and do whatever the hell I want to do. And the, 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 those who are disenfranchised in this era are the small Hispanic sheep farmers who've had their land stolen, or the old Spanish land grantees who've had their land co-opted by Anglo lawyers and bankers and whatnot. Um, so, of course, he finds common ground there. Uh, that's very true, and it, I, I think that holds true. It was one of the interesting thing, things that I found early on in researching and reading Otero and, and some of the other biographies was that he had this relationship with his, the Hispanic community. Yeah. And he found love. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. of course, I mean, you know, that's just the, that's the icing on the cake for right. a storyteller. I mean, to be able to, you know, there's a love story in this, and it's, you know, how can you not love that kind of And it kills him. But yeah, he, got, he dies for it. He dies for love. Yeah, yeah, tell that story, man. That's interesting. Too. Well, he doesn't leave, you know. He does every re after he after he breaks out of jail, and you know, well, the county should have left, right? I mean, get out of Dodge, and he doesn't. He stays, and 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 I was moved by everybody I talked to that it was because he was in love with Paulita, and I think there, I think that's a big part of it. I also think he may have thought he was infallible at this point. He 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 he, he gets out of his jail, kills two jailers in this incredible fashion. Um, with the one Bob Bollinger with his own shotgun. Um, and uh, you've got to feel like you're the man at that point, right? So <laughs> who's going to get you? Garrett's nowhere to be found. Um, so yeah, I mean, why not go back to, the, to your, your, your great love? That's right. So uh, please, is Dying for Love working for you, Billy? <laughs> Where is this right? I mean, are you coming around here? I'm a skeptic, or an agnostic, let's say. A really agnostic. Um, but I do understand the story. I understand why the story took off. And I think that there is an element of this. Is like It's not so much about the factual ability of the kid. It's about the, the fable, the story that sort of, because the paper seized on it, and then the early books, and then the dime novels, and then the... You know, the comic books and TV shows. There is a, a phenomenon there that happens in American culture where, at a certain point, the dog is chasing its tail. It's like the story is a story because we say it's a story. It's not so much that the, the actual factual story is necessarily that interesting. It may or may not be. I, 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 I swear I'm agnostic. But, but uh, what I think is fascinating about um, one of the many elements that, that drives this thing and makes it continue to be such a fascinating thing to all of us is, is, the, is the fact that we really don't know very much about him. 